like that, don't we? Cha-ching, man. That, that's a good sound. Unless, like, you're on the wrong end of it and there's somebody saying cha-ching on you, right? Because they're taking it to the bank or whatever. But we're in the middle of a series on finances and stewardship, and uh, that always makes people nervous, I know. So you're going, you, maybe you weren't here last week and you didn't know we were talking about money, and you came in today saying, oh, man, this is a series we wanted to skip because we know what he's going to talk about. I say, you don't know what we're going to talk about. Today, I'm excited. Um, in the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about the theology of work, the theology of work. But this is what I want you to see. We have this idea, like if, if I would just fall into a bunch of money somehow, if I could just get rich quick, man, that would really make my life good. Would it really? In preparation for this, I, I was kind of doing some studying and I was going to pull a bunch of articles. You could just go you Google it. You can but not while I'm preaching. You, but you can go on the internet and read the statistics. Is it really good for people to win the lottery? The outflow is that some people do okay with it, but for the most part, it's not a good thing. People's life does not get better, it gets worse. Can I tell you that this whole idea, though, is nothing new? Because back in Proverbs, when Solomon would, would write Proverbs. We read Proverbs 13, uh, verse 11 says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Wow, we don't like the little by little. Like, Lord, dump it on me by truckloads, right? I want a wheelbarrow to carry my check home. I, I mean, Lord, would you give me a whole bunch? I think the idea is if you want a whole bunch, gather little by little. Be faithful in the little thing. Be diligent with what you have now so that it can become something bigger as you go. Proverbs 28, verse 19. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who's, who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Proverbs 28, 22, a stingy man hastens after wealth and does not know that poverty will come upon him. All the way back in Proverbs, there was this idea before there was ever a, a, an article or a study uh, of our current time written that if you chase after the, the truckload being dumped on you, it's probably not as good for you if you will just be faithful where you are, bloom where you're planted, work hard where you are, gather little by little and be faithful in it and watch God bless that kind of attitude and that kind of faithfulness. I'm going, going to quote a good friend of mine today. He's here this morning, Greg Manus. He says, and I've heard him say this two or three times, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but he says, when you ask God to provide for you, get ready for a great idea and a job. I'm going to say it again. When, when you ask God to provide for you, get ready for a great idea and work a job. Be ready for, for God to give an idea that you might have to work to bring about so that, because he'll give you creative ideas. Use those creative ideas to, to then bring increase into your life and work hard at it little by little, faithful where you are, and watch God be faithful to pour increase into your life. It's the idea of, even in Deut the Bible, in, Deut in the book of Deuteronomy, says God gives you the power to be successful or another version says, God gives us the power to bring increase or to bring wealth. God will give you the power to do that. But no, most of the time, it's going to happen because you work for it. Because you, you roll your sleeves up and you get dirty and you get out there and you work hard one moment at a time, one day at a time. It doesn't happen by some big truckload of increase. It doesn't happen because somebody gave you something that you didn't deserve. It happens because God gives you the power to day after day be faithful where you are, be committed to the place that he has you, and work for increase. The foundation for a biblical view of work, I want you to see this. It starts right at the very beginning of creation. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Listen, this, this ha always has been, since man was created, this always has been. Genesis 1, verse 28, the Bible says, And God blessed them. How many of you would like his blessing? And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's talking about producing children. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Then he says, subdue it. Subdue what? The earth. Subdue it. Listen, the idea of, of subduing something almost 
has this forceful connotation. If I'm going to subdue Robin, which I can't, if I'm going to subdue Robin, I have to forcefully take her and sit her down and subdue her. If I wouldn't do that, by the way. If I'm going to subdue something, I have to lay my hands on it, roll up my sleeves, probably going to cost me a little bit of sweat, and forcefully stop it from advancing where it is, and I'm going to subdue it. That's the idea that the Lord is giving here. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue the earth. Then he says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Listen, at the end of this week, I plan to hunt, and I'm going to quote this scripture. Lord, you have given me dominion over the fish of the sea. I'm not worried about them because it's wintertime. Over, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing, that big bug. Lord, I, I, just, I, I take claim and dominion and authority over that animal in Jesus' name. Come on. And everything, Robin said, we're still hungry. That ain't working. <laughs> And then another, another passage that gives us this idea. Um, remember, he said to us, subdue the earth. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Don't, don't miss that part. Underline it. Genesis 2.15. Skip over one more chapter. The Lord had just made man in this account. It's the account of the Lord uh, making man, breathing life into him. And then in verse 15, the Bible says, the Lord God took man and put him in the garden. The, the scripture actually says that God planted a garden in Eden. And then the Bible says he makes man, he plants man in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it. To work it and to keep it. So here in the very beginning of creation, we see that God intended for man's purpose to be part of it, to be to work. Some people thought that and think that work flows out of the fall of man. No, the nature of work changed in the fall of man. It went from um, being this gardener to, to now he has to, to work by the sweat of his brow and by the toil. The, the Bible says that, that the, 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 the nature of his work changed. So here's a foundation for, for a biblical view of work. And I just want to give you a couple of points. I'm going to hit these really quickly so I can move on. But first of all, I want you to see that God is a worker. When we're understanding a biblical viewpoint of work, God is a worker. Right here in the creation account, we see that he worked for six days, creating all that is. On the seventh day, he took a rest. That's a pattern for our lives. But God is a worker. All through the scripture, you can see uh, scriptures that speak of the works of God. God has not stopped working because God's nature is that he's a worker. And he created us in his image. In his likeness, he created man, right? And so in that likeness of the fact that he is a worker, he created us also to be workers. So understand that God is a worker. The second thing I want you to see is that work was a part of God's original plan for creation. When he created man, he set him in the garden and he said, I'm going to sit you here and I want you to work it and to keep it. Now, I know this isn't very exciting. We don't really want to think that God created us for work, but he did. He created man in, in the very beginning to work the garden and to keep it. Remember, he said to subdue it, to, to subdue the earth. This is important because what happens when a gardener takes care of a garden? He subdues it. If he, if he wasn't present, if he didn't roll up his sleeves, and if he took the summer off, the garden would not be subdued. It would be out of control, right? I want you to see this. God intends for us to subdue his creation. It's not just the garden anymore. It's in the greater context of creation. What would happen if you just left your place, your house, your land, everything that you have? If you just said, you know what, I'm just going to go away for six or seven months of the summertime in Arkansas, and I'm just going to leave it alone, and I'm not going to worry about anybody doing anything with it. I'm going to leave the windows up on my house. I'm going to leave my yard alone. Nobody's going to touch it. I mean, you know, it would not be subdued. Creation would take over. Vines and, and dust and dilapidation would take over. What is it uh, uh, about, um, uh, about you that, that keeps what you have together? It's the fact that you day after day work it. 
Day after day, you dust your house. Day after day, you sweep your floors. Day after day, you mow the grass. Day after day, you change the oil in your vehicle. All of those things are work, and all of those things are subduing creation. Look around at the world we have today. The fact that we're sitting in this building was man taking what God created in raw form of creation and saying, I'm going to do something with, through the work of my hands, what you have placed in my care. Isn't that amazing that the technology that we experience today is man take, saying, God, I'm going to take what you've given me with the work of my hands and the brains that you've given me, and I'm taking your creation and subduing it so, so that it will be useful for what, what, we, what we need in our lives. The third thing I want you to see is that God uses work to shape our life and character. You may not like going to work every day, but every day it's good for us to go to work. The reason that, that for so many people it's, it's not good for them to fall into a big sum of money is because they would quit working and they would stop the disciplines of life. And it's just not good for, you know, in, in the early stages of life, it's just not good to have too much free time and just be lollygagging through life. It's just not good. How many of you know the discipline, the commitment of doing the things that we should be doing every day when it comes to work are good for our lives? They shape our character. They shape the, the person that we are. They keep us within certain boundaries, right? It's good for us. And then the last one I've already touched on a little bit. Work is the process of redeeming God's creation. Work is the process of redeeming God's creation. Taking what he gave us in raw form and beginning to do something with it. Look around the world. There are places where work isn't a virtue, where people basically just take care of one simple need just to get a little bit to eat in a day, if they can get that, a little bit to drink. And in those places, how many of you know, you don't see buildings like you see here, you don't see the technology that you see here, you see creation in its rawest form because there's not the discipline, the commitment, and the virtue of work. What I want you to see today is that God intends, planned for from the very beginning, and, and purpose for us to work, and work is a good thing. That's a good place to say amen. I know we don't like it, and I know you don't want your preacher talking to you about it, but work is a good thing. Work is, is a, a, a godly thing. Today I want to share with you two flawed ways that we approach work. Two flawed mindsets or two flawed ways that we interact when it comes to working. I'll give them to you really quickly, and then I'll begin to break them down. The first one is idle work. And the second way is being idle when we work. The second way is making an idol of work. We find ourselves at probably at one of the two extremes because we're not good at finding ourselves in the middle, are we? Balance is, is really tough for us. So on one extreme, we find ourselves in the area of work being idle in our work. Maybe a little lazy. That hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Maybe not doing all that we could. We're idle in our work. And on the other extreme of the spectrum, we find ourselves so immersed in work that we've made an idol of work. Can I tell you, both of those are flawed when it comes to how we approach this whole idea of work. We could easily talk about a lot of different things when it comes to working. Um, Proverbs 12, 24 says the hand of the dil diligent will rule while the sloth will be forced into labor. Proverbs 13, 4 says the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. The soul of the diligent is richly supplied. I could have talked about all of those things today, but what I want you to see is this principle that we're going to see in Proverbs chapter number 18. And, and here's the idea. Hard work. Scripture tells us this very plainly. Hard work is rewarded. God rewards hard work. Man rewards hard work. The idea of hard work day after day being committed to, to working is where we find reward. So the first flawed way that we look at work is that we are idle in our work. Anybody ever find yourself in a job that you really didn't care for? <laughs> Amen, pastor. Yes. Hope your boss isn't here today. And if our staff... It's talking about, that's, that's, yeah, we we'll have to talk to you on staff meeting on Tuesday, Monday. Th this whole idea of, 
of um, going to work, and you know, work is just kind of this thing that we, drudgery thing that we go through, and we really don't like being there, and we don't like anything about it, we don't like our boss, we don't like what we do every day, we don't feel appreciated, and so we find ourselves in a place that we can justify all kinds of reasons for why we're idle at work. Proverbs 18.9 says this, though. It says, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys this, this kind of blew my mind. Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Now, I just don't, at the beginning of this, kind of walking down through this, this understanding, I did not understand how the two were correlated. What does destruction have to do with someone who's slack in his work? It's a crazy comparison to me that, that the, the writer of Proverbs says, whoever is lazy in the way he works is just like compared to or a brother of him who destroys. You see, the idea of destroying here is really the idea, when you begin to break down uh, that word in the original context, the original context means, means someone who loves to bring to ruin. I mean, when I, when I was reading this and I was going back and doing some research, I, I kind of started thinking like of uh, evil villains in all of the movies, you know, like who is the, the person that you can think of in a movie that just smiled when destruction came? That's what this word kind of connotates here. I had struggle, a struggle bringing the two together, but as I read and studied what some different theologians said, I began to understand that the writer of Proverbs was talking about the person who is lazy in their work. When they approach work as it, like it, it doesn't matter, they are a, are a brother to him who destroys because the root of the, the fact that they are lazy in their work is rooted in selfishness. Again, we've been talking a lot about what is the root and what is the fruit. The fruit is the, the fact that they are lazy in the way that they work. They go to work day after day. They don't give an honest job for an honest wage. They get over on their boss. They find ways to hide out or or, or use expense money like it shouldn't be used. They they find ways to to get over on the system. They they feel like they don't have to. I'm not appreciated anyway. That's, That's what I'm talking about. Those kind of people. Hopefully that's not us in the room, but if it is, let's look at look at square in the face. That is rooted in some place in selfishness. And saying, I don't have to. I don't want to. They don't appreciate me anyway. They're they're not as good to me as as they should be. So I I, I don't have to. And can I tell you today that in that place of selfishness, it really is a, a place of selfishness that always brings destruction. So people who are idle at work, nobody in this house, obviously. People who are idle at work, That's a broken way to approach the the whole issue of work. If that's you today, let God work in your heart and say, you know what, it's time that you you begin to to do the right thing. Why? Not because somebody recognizes you, not because somebody is good to you, not because they, uh, you know, have, have given you everything that you need. They might not even treat you well, but because God says it, that we should work with our hands and that we should give a, an honest day, that, that we should uh, be diligent in where we are because of that, and because our witness and our reputation depends on it, we should work hard. I'll get to another reason in just a minute. The second flawed idea of work is that when, when we go to the other end of the spectrum and, and we're not lazy at work, but we're so given to work that it becomes an idol. How many of you know work can become an idol? We, we have a word for it. It's called workaholics. Most workaholics don't know they're workaholics or they won't claim they are workaholics. They're just diligently providing for their families. Can I tell you today, we need to do a little intervention because workaholics won't admit to it. We need to just ask ourselves some questions. Are you happiest when you're working? Are you happier working than you are with, than you, than with your family? Come on, somebody. Now, now, listen, some other people on the other end of the spectrum, you need to get a little happier working. <laughs> but some of us in here, we, we struggle with, you know what, we would immerse ourselves in work 24-7, and there has to be balance brought to that too, because work can become too big of a thing. The second question, do you want to make a name for yourself? Are you constantly worried about what others' opinions are of you and, 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 and making sure that you keep your reputation by working hard? 
Again, nothing wrong with hard work, but keep it in balance. Third, little intervention this morning. Do you think of yourself more highly than you should? Like you're really more important than you are. Like the whole place would go under without you. Like nobody could make it if you weren't there. The Bible tells us not to think more highly of ourselves. As a matter of fact, if we just want to be um, very blunt, Stuff goes on without us. Life will go on without us. Businesses will go on without us. Workplaces will go on without us. Projects will go on without us. So don't think that you're the one keeping it all together and that nothing can make it without you because it will. It can. And sometimes we just need, and I'm, I'm really, this really cuts me deep because if Robin were standing up here today, she would say, I struggle with this. At the end of the day, you have to put some things on the shelf because they're always going to be there, right? So you have to put them on the shelf at the end of the day. Go home to your family and realize that this is a, a flawed way of thinking too. Why? Here's why. Because it, this is not rooted in selfishness necessarily, but it can be rooted in greed. It can be rooted in greed. Never content with what we have. So we have to work to get more. Never content with the achievement that we, of where we are. So we have to work harder. Never satisfied with the current success, so we have to dig in and work harder. Never content with our status or our reputation, so we're constantly working because we're never content, we're never satisfied, and the root of all of this is greed. We don't like to call it that. Proverbs 28, 25 says it this way. A greedy man stirs up strife, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. And isn't it true that we could say if we think that we have to work all the time, we have to achieve, we have to go, 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 there's a lack of trust that God will do what he says he will do in our lives, that God will be faithful. If we will bring balance into our lives, the Lord will reward that as well. I love the fact that this proverb is beating, Robin, as you come back, this proverb in in chapter 28, verse 25, it beats science to the punch. So often, you see this in God's word, like scientists are coming up with these novel ideas, so, such profound studies. When, if you go back to the word of God, it said it the whole time. Three scientific studies. Kansas State University pu- published a study in the Financial Planning and R- Review Journal, which found overall well-being is not a priority for workaholics. They have drastically higher percentage of reported cases of depression, increased uh, risk of heart attack, diabetes, weight gain, high blood pressure, anxiety. The point is, making work your idol isn't good for you. It's wrecking your life. Another study showed that the divorce rate doubles for the marriages of people who are partners of workaholics. The third research from the University of North Carolina found that children are workaholics. It's not just you now, it's not just your spouse, but even our children are affected by it. Uh, Our our children are workaholics, uh, they have a higher rate of depression and anxiety. What I'm telling you today is when we have these flawed ways of thinking concerning work, did God intend for us to work? Absolutely. But when we're over here, it's not good. And when we're over here, it's not good. We have to find center on the issue of work. Work is a good thing. Hard work is godly. It's a a, a characteristic of who God is. It should be a characteristic that marks our life. Colossians chapter 3 brings balance to all of it. And I want you to just highlight or underline this because it it really brings the perspective that we need concerning work. Colossians 3 verse 23, the Bible says, whatever you do, I like that. Whatever you do. Whatever you do. It doesn't matter if you're turning a wrench, or if you're typing a keyboard, whatever you do, work heartily. You know, when we talk about football teams, we talk about playing with heart. When we talk about basketball teams, we talk about playing with heart. In the workplace, God's kids should play and work with heart. Heartily, as for the Lord and not for men. I'm so mad at my boss, I'm going to go in and I'm just going to chill today. He won't know. I'm going to find a place where the cameras won't see me and I'm going to do nothing because he doesn't respect me. They don't like me. Can I tell you, take take that line of thinking out of your head and realize he's not the boss anyway. She's not your boss anyway. As for the Lord 
you just got a new boss. As for the Lord and not for men, as a child of God, you don't work for men, you work for God. It's the Lord who gives you the ability to be successful. It's God who pours in you the ability to work. It's God who gave you the job that you were so grateful for on the front end, but now you despise. But what would happen if we went to work and we said, you know what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to work heartily in whatsoever I do. As for the Lord and not for a boss or for a coworker, but unto the Lord, knowing that the Lord will receive that through the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward for you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. What if you worked as unto the Lord? The workplace might look a little different. The attitude might change. Lord, they made me mad this morning, but I'm going to do it as unto you. Lord, they, I'm, oh, they, they made me stew this morning. I got the spirit of slap, but I'm not going to slap them because I'm working unto you. God, guard my tongue so I don't talk bad about them. Right? I know you never feel that way, but I do. Money, wealth, accomplishments, success will not satisfy you. None of that will satisfy you today, friend. But God has called us to work and work day in and day out, be committed to work day in and day out, to go to work. Day, that's, that's a good start for some people, just go to work, right? Get up, get up and go to work. Go to work with a good attitude, not because they're treating you right, not because, listen, God may have you there in the midst of some people who are bitter and ugly and and that you just feel like despise you. He may have you there because somebody's gotta be a light in their world. Somebody's gotta love them. Somebody's gotta share Jesus with them. It might as well be you. We're all the time praying, God, use me, use me, use me. How about you, Lord, just use me right where I am. I don't have to go somewhere. I don't have to go to China or Africa or across town. I can be used right where I am in my workplace. 